Hello, uh, welcome for being here. Uh, this is one of the seminars that uh, from Itable Adventures were putting together to uh, help companies uh, get new ideas and resolve uh, their issues in the, in the COVID uh, times. We have uh, received uh, a lot of uh, attention and inquiries from multiple parties about uh, direct-to-consumer models. Uh, we thought it was good to put together a, uh, an initial event where we could uh, discuss uh, with uh, two experts in the field um, about this, uh, these upcoming models. Um, Eatable Adventures, we are uh, dedicated... Uh, Paula, can you move on? At Eatable Adventures, we believe a startup are leading the way creating solutions on how to transform food is produced, transform and consume. We connect the most disruptive food startups with corporations, investors, and we help develop the right collaborations with a single mission, that is to build up the future food companies. Um, today, uh, we are with Emna Neifar and Ivan Farnetti. Uh, Emna is a chief commercial officer of Cortilia. Ivan is a founder and managing partner at uh, Five Season Ventures. We will start with Enna. Uh, Enna graduated from HEC School of Management in Paris and started her, her path in a strategic consulting at Monitor Deloitte with focus on consumer business and retail industry. In 2013, she moved to Italy and she launched and managed the Italian subsidiary of the French organic retailer Bio Sibon. From 2018, Enna is the chief commercial officer in Cortilia, and in these two years, leading the purchase and marketing team, she achieved a transformational evolution of the product assortment, the launch of a process of marketing automation and personalization of the user experience and promotional strategies, inauguration of the first physical point of sales, announcing the only channel strategy of Cortilia. Uh, and uh, you've been quite busy these two years. Um, your background prior to Cortilia was closely linked to physical retail. What led you to jump to the online side? Uh, hi, everyone. Actually, when I, start, when I met the founder of Cortilia for the first time, what was very fascinating was not only the channel of distribution that was digital, but uh, all the digital and the data-driven part uh, of uh, the e-commerce. When you have an e-commerce, you have a lot of data uh, on the product, on the customer, on the channels, uh, a lot of insights that make you live in a different world, uh, you react very quickly, and you have a lot of insight uh, that you can turn into daily decisions of new products uh, and uh, new features of the service uh, that can uh, build a business model completely different from the retail or the physical retail, even if at the end you are selling food to the end customer. Mm -hmm. And COVID has uh, for sure impacted, impacted your operations. Uh, which are the most demanding areas at the moment? Uh, when it first started, the most critical part was uh, technical and UX. Uh, Imagine a physical place when you get only 100 people can go at a time and suddenly you have 10,000 or hundreds of people who, can, who want to go in this place. So uh, it's crowded and the technological part was very challenging. Then the other part was uh, the operations. Um, you know that in all the European countries and especially in Italy, we had this uh, panic that led the people to, met, uh, to, to want to make a very large shopping, uh, having it immediately, stock uh, a lot of uh, undeperishable goods. So the impact on operation was challenging. Uh, once, uh, one for the quantity of requests, uh, and two for the quality because people wanted everything immediately they had a lot of questions on safety they had a lot of concerns about uh, how we select the product and how we deliver it to your doorstep 
So we will get back to you, and now we go to present uh, Ivan. Ivan Fornetti is a co-founder and managing partner in Five Season Ventures. Uh, he's been an active venture capitalist for the last 20 years. Um, he's the Five Season Ventures is the first Europe fund fully focused on, on food tech. He's uh, passionate about products and technology innovation. I'm not solving big challenges in the food industry from alternative sources of proteins to functional foods, new model of food distribution, and reduction of uh, food waste. At five seasons, he's invested in gene editing company, Tropic Biosciences, pet nutrition company, Butternut Box, plant-based meat alternative, uh, uh, co, uh, obviously Cortilia, a meat replacement company, Y Food Labs, and direct to consumer, Just, Just Spices. Uh, Ivan, you, you, you have been also very busy, and I know you are very busy these days, so thanks for joining us. Uh, similarly, your background has shifted from a general market uh, approach to a food industry specific. What is what attracts you to join the, the food segment? Hi, Jose Luis, and thank you for having me here. It's the um, it's, uh, first time we have this type of uh, virtual conference, so we'll We'll, get, we'll try to get um, used to it probably more often than, than, than ever. But um, so, um, yeah, I think we, we I, I come from a background of investing in technology companies. So I started investing in startups back in 97 uh, when I was in London. Um, and I've been through different technology funds and mostly invested in software and, and Internet services um, throughout, you know, good days and bad days. I think I've seen the dot-com bust, you know, I've seen the, the 2008 crash and all that. So this is yet another crisis. And I think uh, our job wouldn't be fun if it was uh, just uh, simple. Uh, what got me to, into uh, food, food and food tech? Um, I think it was a very distinctive moment when in 2015, I visited the, the, the Global Food uh, Expo in Milan. It was like 25 million people visited uh, the, the exhibition center uh, over over a number of months, and, and you know, it was the first time where I could actually see the magnitude of what um, was happening. You know, the urbanization of, of people, where you know, food doesn't grow in cities. The uh, reduction of availability of resources, the amount of waste, the um, uh, the problem that obesity and malnutrition were were causing. So, as an investor, uh, I think we have one skill, I guess, which is pattern recognition, right? We look at something, we try to understand the pattern and see where the pattern is going. And to me, when we started to really think about this, it was at the end of 2015, the beginning of 16, I thought, you know, the magnitude of the challenge and the transformation in the food industry reminded me of what I saw uh, 18 years before uh, when the internet started to challenge the world of technology. But not only, uh, the transformation was massive. The underlying forces were, were tremendous. The macroeconomic in, environment was, was favorable, but I also saw something else. On one side, the demand for better food system was not met by the incumbent. The large uh, food companies are really good at optimizing the process and repeating it at large scale and reduce the cost of whatever they do to a mass market uh, world. But that comes with... Um, inflexible system it's much easier for a startup to pick up some of those challenges and so what i saw is the inability of the large food companies to really switch uh to a different gear just like the technology giants of 20 years before and on the other side hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs starting new companies much agile and much faster so as an investor to me that was the trend that was the pattern that i recognized from you know 20 years earlier and i thought Food tech is going to be the next big revolution, and that's where we decided to start uh, Five Season Ventures. And with my business partner Nicolo Manzoni, who had been investor in Beyond Meat, Impossible Food, and Clara Food, and Perfect Day on the early days, we had the horizontal knowledge of technology development of fast-growing companies and the inside view of food tech. We brought on board a team of people that uh, come with pedigree in um, in food manufacturing and scale up, like Giancarlo Dario. Uh, who was uh, in R&D and, and, and production at Barilla for 20 years. So we created a team of people that understand growth, technology, and food production. Okay. Uh, we, we similarly see that uh, the food industry is uh, becoming what, what the internet was uh, 20 years ago. 
and, and it's a tremendous uh, set of opportunities laying ahead for, for the companies that uh, take the step and, and, and go forward. So to put to frame the conversation, to put everything in context, uh, the direct to consumer is rising in the in the food environment, and we see a few elements that are basically helping to to lead this uh, this uh, development. E-commerce uh, growth is uh, is there. Consumers are looking for uh, food items beyond retail. So. Uh, Specifically, food delivery has been fundamental in the in, in consumers accepting that they can uh, acquire fresh food and, and consume it through online uh, properties. Uh, consumer demands convenience and they demand it on a fast, personalized, and adapted way. Uh, personalization and, and uh, adapting consumer to consumer taste is basically happening more and more these, these days. Uh, all these uh, uh, developments are happening mostly through uh, startups that are delivering the flexibility that the consumers are demanding. And they are basically finding out the spaces between the, the large uh, companies and making their market niche and growing that market, market niche into a business that is sensible and, and meaningful. Uh, corporations are speeding up uh, e-commerce and uh, mostly these days with COVID, many corporations are uh, questioning how to get into uh, direct-to-consumer. Uh, PepsiCo, for example, acquired a Chinese snack uh, company, the Anchuris, uh, for a seven, over 700 million US dollars in order to advance into direct-to-consumer uh, CPE models. And investors are uh, define, definitively uh, identifying the opportunity that uh, food and technology and direct-to-consumers are bringing to the table and ju are jumping into uh, the bandwagon, uh, investing into companies like uh, Y Food. Um, let's go to, to what are the takeaways we want to get out of this uh, session. The first one is uh, to define and frame what different direct-to-consumer models uh, exist and how startups are disrupting. Uh, what are the benefits and barriers of direct-to-consumer models? And how is uh, COVID affecting the development of uh, these models, whether positively, uh, whether this is for the short term or is some a trend that we will see in the, in the long term? Let's go to the, to the first uh, of these uh, takeaways, uh, defining direct-to-consumer models and how startups are developing them. And uh, you are obviously at the core of this, uh, this activity. Uh, how do you, are you managing direct-to-consumer in the food space and what, how do you see the projection? Actually, the trend has been uh, active for uh, more than 10 years, but what we noticed recently is that the consumer is uh, always looking for more information information on the origin of the product, on the ingredients, uh, on uh, a certain speed of uh, the service. So all these aspects lead to the growth of direct-to-consumer. With the farmer part, uh, because Cortilia is positioned on uh, the fact that it delivers to you directly from the farm. So on this part, there is also all the storytelling aspect that clients value a lot. They want to know uh, where does it come from, but also who is behind it, the origin, the process, and the environmental and social impact. All these elements put together lead to uh, a bulk of uh, a product and the service that respond to this new uh, customer expectations. What we see in Italy is that uh, this growth has been made through two channels. One is very innovative, let's say, and digital, which is the one that Cortilia uh, is uh, leading actually in the Italian market. And the other one is the more unstructured uh, channel. So it's uh, really direct to consumer from the farmer itself with maybe informal uh, user experience like ordering by phone or um, that can have also their own targets like uh, for example other uh, not urban places uh, or uh, different uh, age populations. What we see in this period is that the service part uh, is becoming important as much as the product part. And this is what will make the difference 
uh, what is making the difference already now and what will make the difference in the future. Okay. Um, I think, you know, it, it, if there is one thing that um, we can probably say at this point in time is that direct to consumer food is the winner of the COVID period, right? I'm sure there are other um, businesses in digital, you know, uh, content or things like that have done really well, but I, I'm, I'm amazed at the way um, direct to consumer in food has managed to do well for businesses and well for society. You know, making sure that people were not panicking too much uh, because they couldn't get access to food when. Um, uh, people working in the health ser ser service, uh, you know, were taken care of by a lot of companies that could get them food directly at home and making sure that they could do what they had to do. Uh, not leaving behind elderly people that couldn't go to the store and buy things and making sure that they were the first one to be um, catered for. It. And, and I think I'm really proud of, of, you know, our portfolio companies, but a lot of the others that I've seen doing incredibly well. And I think, you know, if we just step back a second and not really think only COVID, COVID, because I think, you know, these days there's a bit of, a bit of um, uh, too much of that. But, you know, it's interesting, but the, you know, the, digital, the digital world has now morphed into the physical world. Like 15 years ago, a traditional food company would develop a product, give it to a wholesaler, the wholesaler would give it to a retailer. And then, you know, maybe three, four months later, Nielsen would collect the data and you would know if it's doing okay. If you're, if you're lucky, you can have some insider from there and try to iterate. Now, the, the, the reason why D2C is really um, different is it has brought in a lot of the techniques and the mindset from the digital world into the physical world. And this is, this is unsettling for, for the incumbent. And, uh, you know, and again, I think at, at this stage, I wanted to just give a little bit of a a taxonomy, I mean, there, there isn't one, but we're, we're making one up internally. When we look at portfolio, uh, potential investment companies, there are different stage of direct to consumer, right? So on one extreme hand, you have a digital native vertical brand. This is a company that is born digital, has the complete control of the supply chain from manufacturing to distribution. The whole experience is controlled uh, through technology. One of our portfolio company, Button or Box, it's pet food, fully uh, personalized, uh, fully digital. You can only buy it online. And you know, that's the classic example. You have <clears throat> the digital vertical native retailer, which is you know, Cortilia. You can only buy Cortilia product through Cortilia. Uh, the supply chain is integrated with specific suppliers that you can only find on Cortilia and nowhere else. And the, the experience, again, is controlled entirely from a data driven product from consumer back to the supplier through technology. So that's what we really call D2C. However, some of the companies can also use direct to consumer as a secondary channel. And this is through their own website, they build it, they morph it, but maybe production is outsourced, maybe they use co-packers, maybe they also use a traditional retail channel and the omni-channel strategy of companies like Just Spices or Y Food is proving to be incredibly good for type of products where the basket size and the, the type of product actually isn't just perfect for one channel but can work throughout different channels. If you step back then, <clears throat> an easier way to look at direct to consumer is the classic Amazon strategy. Whether you're a vendor approved or whether you're a FDA and you're testing uh, a new market, right? A company in Spain could probably put a few pallets on Amazon, try to test whether there is a reception in a new market and with that, try to get some information. The quid pro quo, it's, it's easier and cheaper to do. On the other side, you get very limited data and that's the richness of the D2C market that we don't really get by only selling on Amazon. The final level, so the basic level, what we see is what we call the digital activation. So companies like this, uh, which produces plant-based uh, chicken and, and bacon, would not sell that product through direct to consumer easily because the unit value, the basket size is too small. However, those companies are great at creating awareness through social media and the digital channels. So the activation of the community 
happens through a direct discussion with their customers, which in turn become, you know, customers become, you know, retailers bec become resellers and become restaurants and, and all that. So those are the five levels from the most engaged to the minimum. And as investor, we look at all of them. Okay. So it's a very, very, very good description. So you, you think that the traditional uh, manufacturers will find a single model or they will have uh, to address uh, multiple different roles in, in this uh, direct to consumer uh, approach? Um, I think, I think, you know, the large, you, I think large, medium and small traditional manufacturers have now seen what happens. Um, when a very uh, astute team of founders with digital backgrounds comes in without the limitation, the bureaucracy and the politics that affect, you know, large businesses, you know, in, in any case, and are able to uh, test and iterate very fast. Uh, there is a, uh, is a very smart um, um, corporate guy called Bill Horsky who works at uh, Mondelez, who uh, came up with the term of ankle biters. And we use this term a lot. Uh, this is uh, the term that the, the, you know, he uses when looking at maybe a small snacking company or a small uh, breakfast cereal company that is making 10 million, but very fast. Mm. It's an ankle bite. It's a little mosquito that is annoying. It's not gonna change the dynamic of the world. And what you normally do is you neglect them. You take your eyes away, you're, you're sticking to your core business and you know, five years or three years later, that company is making hundreds of millions of revenues. The story of uh, Soylent uh, in the US, everybody laughed at them, you know, there were jokes about it and people say, yeah, well, it's never gonna happen. And now Soylent is a very, very credible company uh, built through the direct to consumer, built through the digital uh, channels. And now there are like also copycats and, and you know, followers in, in Europe and they are doing incredibly well. And I think, uh, you know, the, the cat is out of the bag. Large corporations now know that this is a channel. Mm. They are mixed with the curiosity and a bit of fear. I think uh, probably more curiosity and the will to experiment. I think the, the challenge there is hiring the people that have the skill set uh, to do what needs to be done yeah. and let them free to experiment without maybe some of the constraints that are typical of larger corporations. Yeah, this this is something that we are actually we, we fully agree. We are seeing this happening, and, and it's the, the right uh, the right path. And I'm glad to create also Gil with will join us in a future uh, seminar webinar in this uh, in this series. So uh, he will be with us uh, soon. Uh, let's go to the following uh, question: uh, What are the benefits and barrier of uh, direct to consumer models? And Actually, in the direct consumer, the most um, interesting advantages are related to the traceability of the product and the freshness, which are very tangible because I can tell you a lot of things on the branding <laughs> and the relationship, but this is not very tangible. But when you have your uh, strawberry box uh, in your hand and you see that it has been picked uh, only a few hours ago, in the farming, in the, in the farming uh, retail, this is very important because direct means also a short supply chain. And with a short supply chain, you have short delivery times. So often you receive at home like, uh, and you see it a lot with the fruit, with the leaves. You receive the strawberries and the spinach that have been picked only a few hours ago from the farm. And this is, uh, for our clients, one of the first uh, satisfaction uh, criteria because they uh, really see how the freshness and its impacts, obviously, the taste. So the freshness and the taste. The other part is uh, the traceability because we are all worried now about what we consume. Where does it come from? how uh, which treatment uh, did you apply uh, are you sure it's not uh, you know italians but maybe also uh, everywhere in the world they exaggerate a little bit on uh, scenarios of uh, maybe it comes uh, from a dangerous place maybe it comes uh, from um, 
a production chain that is not uh, very um, that is not uh, that I cannot trust. So trust uh, is uh, communicated through this short supply chain. You know exactly the person who it is. If you go on the Cortilia website, you can even see the picture of the person. And with the addition of social network and the newsletters, we transfer all the atmosphere also that is in the camps directly to your home. So maybe you go in the, directly on Instagram, you see the farmers that are working, uh, that are preparing your uh, tomorrow's meal. <laughs> and this is very important for our customers because it's not just a marketing argument. It is also the trust you put in the product, you taste, you have, and uh, all the um, benefits uh, you can have from uh, a product where you know exactly where it comes from. Uh, of course, uh, every, uh, every benefit has a side effect. Uh, working directly with the farmer also means uh, a lot of uncertainty because um, if we have a short supply chain and some incidents happen, uh, maybe your product is at risk. So you order the strawberries for tomorrow, uh, but unfortunately today it is raining and uh, you, you don't have the strawberries tomorrow morning. Uh, but companies like Cortilia have this role to uh, take the direct to consumer, uh, even if it is applied to farming, uh, to a stronger level of uh, uh, structure. So for example, we diversify the risk, uh, we diversify the geographic, uh, um, the geographical uh, supply, so we are always sure to have the product. We diversify the risk also of the packaging, uh, uh, in that case, uh, you are sure, uh, even in a, a fragmented market, because the farming market is really fragmented, uh, even with a fragmented market, you have a player that is able to aggregate all the offer and to bring it together to your home. And this is another difference with the small players. I told you before, for example, the farmer, uh, where you can send the WhatsApp and order and they deliver directly to you. It's not only a difference of user experience, it's also how exhaustive the offer is and how it can uh, take to your uh, house uh, the complete shopping. Mm -hmm. But trust is certainly an area that uh, e-commerce was lacking in, in food and, and specifically in fresh food. So this is very important that uh, you are making a solid connection with uh, the, the producer and, and, and you are bringing this uh, experience that normally the physical retail is, is unable to, to, to offer and to deliver. Yes, actually in the physical retail, you build the trust with another uh, approach. You see the product and you see exactly how it is and you can read uh, directly the labels and everything and you choose. I take it, I don't take it. Mm -hmm. While in the e-commerce you have to trust a screen, mm -hmm. uh, a screen with a photo and a small description. And maybe you know that uh, most of the people now do the shopping through the smartphone. So it is a very limited space of screen with very small pictures. Um, and we build trust also in the fact that we photograph exactly what you receive at home. Mm -hmm. So if uh, 200 grams are made of uh, 20 small strawberries, we take the picture exactly of this box. So there is no disappointment when you receive it. The other part uh, we try to build trust is uh, having a community of customers who talk together uh, indirectly or directly, directly through the events, even if now we don't, uh, unfortunately, we are stopping them. Uh, in the events where all our customers gather, they can exchange, ah, oh, I tried this product, you tried this one, I recommend you use this one. Or the digital part of it, which is uh, the NPS, uh, Trust Pilot, uh, if you, before today, before you buy a product, or even before, before the consideration part of the funnel, uh, you go and see on Trustpilot how is the 
mm. core of the merchant. And this is an important part, even if it is digital, uh, to transmit uh, trust because trust is built through the corporate means, but also through the community means. Mm. So, Ivan, you mentioned data as an as an as a benefit before. And uh, what 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 are the benefits and, and barriers do you see in the in the direct to consumer models? Well, once um, <clears throat> once you start to look at um, the model of food distribution and food production, as I said, historically, you have a rear mirror view of the data. So whether you have uh, you know Nielsen data or whatever. Uh, source you have, it's normally a T minus one, T minus two, T minus three in terms of month. And for for many uh, many years, that that per that was perfectly enough. You know, changes in consumer preferences weren't as fast. You know, TV was you know broadcasting a certain program that was the clock that created awareness and purchase. Now that's all out of the window, right? Uh, food preferences and trends uh, change a lot faster people decide that uh, plant-based is hot and you know in the space of a few months the whole world knows that it's hot and then they may decide that there is something else so it's very hard for um, for anybody thinking about product development pricing adjustments to do that in real time when all you have is data that is three months old mm -hmm. even more so in food when seasonality is very important if you can get your price right for the Christmas season, you're gonna maximize. If you get it wrong, you know, you're gonna to have to wait again. So data is very, very important. It's very important for uh, product development, as Hemna was saying. Um, if, um, if you figure out that um, people don't eat um, sausage and mash anymore, but the pictures on Instagram are uh, by celebrities, by athletes, by everybody, are pictures that show avocado on toast being the new fad. Well, if you're a spices company, maybe you should pick that information as soon as it comes out, come out with a product real fast, chuck it on the market D2C and see what happens. If you're right, you're gonna be six to eight months in the market before any of the traditional guys are gonna be able to pick up the trends and figure out whether that's something to do. So, it is important for marketing decision, for pricing decision, deciding, you know, we were, we were interested because, you know, at some point when you have a direct connection with, with your customers, it's the purchasing data at what time, which is the first item that they put on the basket, you know, all sorts of things, but you have customer service. And I was talking about it and at Cortilia and at other uh, companies, when the customer calls you in, Right, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity to pick up data and information about preferences, about um, a conversion. It's an ability, you have the ability to convert and renew and re-engage, which none of the traditional guys have. So it's interesting that when people say, well, but, but you know, is, is this easier or more difficult to do than traditional food? I say it's just different because the certain, there are certain skill sets and certain um, uh, level of experience that you need to have in making traditional food, which are really specific to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same way, the skill sets to make a successful D2C company are very different. I don't think they're, you know, if, when I list the, 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 the critical people to hire for D2C business, the data analyst, so the person that understand what data we're going to segment, how we're going to use it, how we're going to uh, bring it back into the business lines is super, super important. I don't think there is any person with an AI background hired by Danone or, you know, whoever as a first priority, right? Maybe eventually you do, but, you know, not having a founder that comes from that digital background and understand power of data, it's a handicap for anybody willing to start a D2C business. So data, data, data is fundamental. Um, because at some point, the easy part will finish. And optimization and optimization and optimization becomes a religion where you have optimization in the conversion, in the campaigns that you do, in which channel you do, which influencer you're gonna manage or not. And then, the, you know, God forbid you have a subscription model. So the renewal cycle and all that, it's all data driven. So that, that, 
implies that um, startups, when they develop the direct-to-consumer models, they should have a very strong focus on the package, data package and information that they're going to provide to the, to the product owners. Um, and vice versa, the product owners really need to select the platforms that they're going to collaborate with based on the data they're going to obtain, as well as return, economic return and reach. I'll give you a slightly different answer if you're talking about a startup doing it or yep. a corporate doing it, because I think it's different. Um, I think a corporate will have to study very carefully what um, package to use mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, um, uh, enterprise scalability, security, you know, all of the really good features that you need to, to look at. Also in terms of, you know, the political acceptance, in terms of the ownership, you know, it, it's, a, it's a decision that normally would go through a number of iteration of consultants or more and try to understand how that system is going to interoperate with other systems, whether it's building credit score, you know, supply chain, all that. A startup doesn't have that. You know, you just get on Shopify, you hack together a site, you put up a web and a, and a mobile site and have a go. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a good um, startup founder, you're going to think of one thing, one thing and one thing only. The experience that I'm going to provide to customers is going to be 10 times better than whatever else is out there in terms mm -hmm. of the quality of the food when people receive the courgette of, uh, of emna they love it they're going to go online and they say oh my god these are the best courgette the best carrot i've ever had in my life right that's important they're going to come on time perfectly with a nice note or something special a little surprise delight your customer first after that once you're uh, Shopify platform is saturated when you need to order more instances of AWS because the load balancer is not working anymore. Okay, that's a great thing. That's when you go to a VC and you raise money and you know you you scale it up properly. But I think it's uh, uh, I think it's the lean startup methodology in a way from a technical standpoint. But make no shortcut on the quality of the product you sell. Okay, good. So before we move to the next question, I would like to remind to the audience that uh, we will do a Q&A at the end and um, we are happy to start receiving questions and we will move uh, to those questions after the next uh, question and, and discussion. So next we are going to discuss about, uh, and I, you said before you didn't want to restrict to COVID, but uh, how is the current situation affecting to the, to the development of these models, Ivan? Do you think uh, uh, the activity and the increase of use of uh, direct to consumer services and, and e commerce in general is going to stay in time or is, is just a, a temporary uh, fix to, uh, to a market closing? Well, I'll keep it short because I think nobody has the real answer. So I think at best I can give you an opinion. So I think the other day the CEO of Microsoft, Nadella, said, you know, um, the last two months. Uh, have created digital transformation for the next two years. Um, and that's true, I think, throughout uh, every sector. Some sectors have been uh, really affected negatively by COVID. Uh, I think food uh, services have been negatively affected. Retail has been okay. And I think direct to consumer food has been taking a lot of market share. Uh, so Cortilla has been doing fantastically well, both socially and economically. I think the, the spirit has been tremendously positive throughout this uh, incredibly difficult time. Uh, customers have responded throughout uh, you know, the, the sectors. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we joke and, and maybe in Italy, you really needed the end of the world to get people to shop online. So now we, we got pretty close to it. Uh, but I think the convenience, the experience, the quality, I think there's going to be an unelastic response after the, the virus is going to be, you know, no longer the priority of, of everybody. Mm -hmm. The harder a country has been hit and the tougher the restrictions, I think the more appreciation people will have for the new way of living and they will be slower in going back to whatever was before. So I think, um, I think uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I've seen some statistics, but you know, they're, you know, they are whatever they're worth, but a lot of the statistics that you see throughout Europe indicate that 
a lot of the people who use online delivery platforms for the first time uh, indicate that they are like more likely than ever before to continue to use them after. So I think, uh, I think this is not just a blip. Uh, and I think customer service and retention are going to be the metrics that every entrepreneur needs to focus on for after this phase. But I think it's here to stay. Uh, that's good. Uh, Emna, you, you actually have uh, produced a few slides, a plan for how to react to this uh, situation. And, and we have a couple of slides that uh, maybe you can go through them if you want, or you can talk openly and we present to the, to the audience. Uh, yes. So, so uh, what we noticed, even if the timeline was short, or more, a little more than two months, but we have been through different phases during uh, this. Uh, it was very intense. <laughs> uh, it was very intense and it uh, requested a very high reactivity because every day something was going on and you had to manage to go quickly through new uh, implementation of uh, new features of the website, uh, new product offer also, etc. What we noticed is that uh, starting February 24th, which is the first official day in Italy of panic, let's say, um, till the lockdown, which was March 8th, we have been only reacting. So every day there was a new news and every day the panic because it's all related to the customer sentiment. Of course, we are offering products and services, but we are also responding to the um, more than panic, maybe un anxious mood of the consumer because nobody wanted to go out from home on one side. And on the other side, uh, there was this panic that uh, suddenly we will uh, all remain without food. And in this phase, we have been reacting, making especially safety measures also to uh, make sure everyone remains, of, of course, safe, but also to uh, transmit this message to our clients. Uh, so all the parts of uh, the equipment for the warehouse. Uh, uh, before, for example, we used to do a very eco-friendly, uh, eco uh, measure which was uh, when we uh, bring you the new shopping uh, we collected back the boxes but we stopped this because even if the probability to get infected through this is very close to zero uh, we thought it was a contact point uh, that was uh, absolutely not necessary in this case so all these measures to uh, demonstrate you are reacting on the safety part. The other part is all the parts uh, related to your performance because suddenly you have a huge demand and you have to respond to this demand on two uh, aspects. The tech, the tech aspect, so as I said before, the servers, the UX, etc but also the logistics, because you cannot serve everyone <laughs> with the current warehouse, uh, the current transportation system, and the current supply chain. And unfortunately, this is the limitation that remains most over time, and that is today still valid, because you cannot triplicate the warehouse. Uh, it's. Uh, we are talking about digital, but behind digital, there is a physical uh, limited space where you cannot move more than uh, X pieces by day. And the pieces uh, currency has been uh, our discussion every day because uh, people started buying a different mix of products. So uh, it created a lot of pieces of low value like uh, I don't know, chickpea or uh, similar things. And the first phase of reaction um, shifted to uh, an adapt, uh, a daily adapt of the business model uh, through uh, especially uh, following the um, every day what is going on on the public and legislation part because at the beginning there was a lot of confusion in Italy, but also in other parts 
which are the red zones. So you cannot deliver there or you cannot bring uh, the product from this part. But then everywhere was a red zone and there, there were new extractions. Uh, and this played a lot of um, also uh, measures based on uh, psychology and uh, the role of communication emerged as very important to uh, you know, we talked about trust on the product side before, but uh, now trust shifted also to the experience, uh, shifted also to uh, you can trust me because you have been a historical client, but today you cannot shop because the capacity is limited. Uh, we have been in a compassion mode uh, with a few um, customer segments. So we implemented, for example, a white list for the people working in the hospital so they can do their shopping with more serenity. The role of communication has been also in the use of the words we go to uh, send you in the newsletter that are completely different. The call to action is no longer go online and shop this product, but stay safe. And this is a very important um, part. The other adaption we had to make uh, very quickly, we had to make very quickly, and even today it is uh, still important. And even uh, talked before about the role of data and the high reactivity uh, is uh, today possible thanks to data because you can identify, identify the trends very quickly when you are a digital company. For example, the flower and yeast part, uh, we identified just in the second day. In the first week, we already identified that people started taking uh, higher portions of the products because maybe uh, now you have, you're no longer single you go to your you went to your parents home so the portions completely changed uh, the role of prevention for example uh, there is this myth that people have been uh, stocking on pantry it is true that they have been speaking on uh, stocking on pantry but it is also true that they incremented their purchase of fruits and vegetables because there was a high perception of uh, I need to bring these vitamins in my body to uh, be more immune uh, and to be a, bit, a little bit stronger uh, if I have uh, attacks, let's say. Uh, we have also seen a sanification trend uh, apart, the sanitizer for the hands, but also all the um, uh, house uh, parts. So we have reacted very quickly to insert the right product. All the categories have been reviewed to adapt to these new consumer patterns that are completely different. Maybe they existed, but they didn't have this importance. And this was very important also how you react. Uh, and then now we started a uh, a third phase, let's say, that is what is the new model, even if uh, we know that the uncertainty is still going on. But the new model, the new normal is not just the normal, uh, the back to normal. It's, uh, as we say, a new normality. So we have to understand very well what are the behavioral patterns that are willing to last in the time. And this is very important for the people who are doing the R&D on the product, the people who are making uh, um, the UX, because now they can understand what to put first in the website. This is very important also for uh, the consumption of the same product, but in a different way. For example, one of the interesting trends we identify, what I call, all sh we are all chefs which is uh, what you used to do before in the restaurant, now you do it at home. So we noticed an increase in all the parts of uh, the wine, the usual aperitivo you used to do in the bar, now you do it at home. You are cooking fish of a certain type. 
you are cooking uh, certain types of meat that usually used to cook very uh, very little because you used to take them at the restaurant. So we are identifying all these trends to create the new assortment, the new product assortment, the new way of selling it, the new way of presenting it to you. I think also all the organic part is, uh, we already see the trend, but it will get even further. Uh, in France, I see it even with a higher speed. The organic uh, channels, distribution channels in, uh, increased, uh, and also the organic products in the uh, classical uh, retail. Uh, I think the part of food supplements will increase also for two reasons. One is, is the immunity segment, uh, and the other one, unfortunately, we have been at home, we have been eating, uh, we have been putting on weight, uh, we did a little sport, so all the parts food supplements related, uh, related also to the protein intake because we have been doing pizza at home and uh, now it's time to, to go back to a, a normal body also. Okay. Um, and over time we will continue this phase. I think uh, the winning model, as I put, uh, will be very adaptive because every day a new thing is emerging and we are not sure how the summer will be. So this is also a new trend that we will follow very closely because if we spend summer at home, it means uh, uh, whether you do food or you do gardening things or you do swimming pools, uh, uh, I think this will be a very important phase uh, where uh, we will see new custom, uh, consuming uh, patterns uh, and uh, trends. Okay. So um, we, we will move on with uh, questions. We have a, a few questions already. Um, feel free to, to post them either in the comments or addressing directly to the panelists. Um, we have one question, uh, a few questions uh, related with uh, Amazon, actually. Um, so um, Amazon, um, one of the biggest problems is the uh, environmental cost of uh, packaging. Does uh, D2C have uh, a structural problem uh, uh, with the need of packaging that is basically affecting the, the environment? And this, uh, does it sound reasonable that every, every food item comes uh, packaged individually? Uh, I can talk for the Cortilia target, which is really a bit different from the normal person, let's say. Uh, you know that one of our distinctive features is a sustainability, and our client has always been more sustainable than average. In this period, the increase of packaging has been related to the increase of quantity, and this is unfortunately true, but we didn't put over packaging uh, for the safety part because we, we privileged other ways uh, to do the safety, like uh, the, the sprays, uh, the x-rays, uh, and uh, other disinfecting uh, features, let's say. Uh, what I noticed on the packaging side is that, unfortunately, the client feels uh, more comfortable with packaged goods, even if at the end you will wash the vegetables. So maybe uh, little by little, this overpacking uh, phobia will uh, will uh, relax a little bit. Okay. In terms of uh, opportunities for new direct-to-consumer channels uh, about getting finance, what are the parameters that will be evaluated by investors now, Ivan? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the same as before. I don't think there is any difference. Um, First and foremost, speed, speed of growth. You know, if you have something that is working and you can show progressive growth, um, that's always gonna be the first thing that people see. So what is the right level of growth? Uh, coming from the digital world, I didn't think it was possible, but we see a lot of, not a lot, but we see, a, we see quite a few businesses growing more than 100% year on year. Certainly when you are less than 10 million in revenues, it's certainly possible. Uh, after you pass the first level, so growth is, uh, is uh, everybody's favorite, favorite color. I think then you start looking to the, the margins back. 
um, and, and within the margin stack, uh, try to get to CM2 positive, you know, quickly, uh, not just in terms of the business, but, you know, quickly in terms of the purchase behavior. So if a business takes um, a loss, think of meal kits, meal kits, you know, you need to get into your fourth or fifth or sixth box before you pay back the cost of acquisition. So we looked a lot at, at uh, payback periods. We looked a lot at margin stack and the CLV equation. So large AOVs are great because you know, the margin stack is great, but also large AOV may mean that you only buy you know, every once in a while, right? So high frequency of purchase and, and the, the CLV versus CAC equation, just like in any digital business um, are very important. And um, I think those are, those are the important thing. And then I would say, um, not because of the previous question, but because it's really important to us as well. A food business, a digital business need to have a higher purpose than just sell you the next sugary drink or the next you know, candy. Uh, whether it is a healthier product, whether it is a more sustainable supply chain, whether it is a more conscious type of approach, I think, you know, the new generation of customers that Emna talks about, the one that actually read the information, they want to see where the food comes from, how it's done, by whom, and ethically or not, uh, will not forgive um, the, you know, hiding the monkey just because you want to make another two basis point of, uh, of gross margin. So um, another question, uh, this one is for, for Emma. Uh, can you elaborate on how, as a platform, you work uh, in the in the cases that uh, the your producers loses the, their stock? Do you substitute by a different uh, supplier? Do you just simply run other stock, or do you have any active role into into these type of situations? We don't hear you. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, this is an interesting part, even if uh, uh, in normal times, let's say, uh, even can say it for the portfolio, but I recommend for every portfolio, uh, whether it is customer, supplier, anything, diversification, it's an old recipe. And unfortunately, it is still true. We used to have a, di a diversification of suppliers also based uh, on the geographical and climate risk. Imagine the example of before of the strawberry, uh, and now it is real for the fruit. Uh, you have uh, some climate, uh, climate uh, unexpected events uh, that unfortunately take off all the suppliers' uh, products. So diversification has always been a mantra. The other thing that was very important and specific to this period is uh, the exchange of information with a high frequency. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe you don't know, but uh, we have a predictive, our predictive model is open to our suppliers. So uh, they receive the order, for example, today for tomorrow. But our model is also open in the future for them to see it. So they can already see now what will happen, more or less, of course, in a week time, in a month's time, with the predictive model with, with which we are working uh, for uh, replenishment. And this allows also the supplier to see in real time how much quantity is expected and to call us immediately and say, no, I stop because I don't have all this uh, product um, uh, quantity. What we noticed is that it was not the product itself that was missing, but maybe other pieces, for example, the transportation. Uh, for the long-term uh, milk, there was a problem of Tetra Pak. So at some point, for example, everything you sold in Tetra Pak was sold out because there was no packaging. And the transparency and the current exchange with the supplier allows you all the time to be updated. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question for you, Ivan. Uh, did any of your companies in portfolio in urgent need of cash in the past two months? Um, how you reacted? Did you can talk about it? Uh, you know, we do. Uh, uh, so this is this is weird, right? Uh, this is very weird. 
because you wouldn't expect this to, to be the case. But um, so we had three uh, portfolio companies that uh, were fundraising in Q1. Uh, there were three extremely successful fundraising rounds. Uh, I think in total, uh, three companies raised 65 million. Um, and this is testimony of the fact that uh, food tech, and in one case, agri-tech, um, are hot topics. Uh, the, the truth is all of those engagements or the, the due diligence, I think, uh, you know, started probably around uh, October, November, December in that period of time. So some of the field visits, some of the factory visits have um, happened before. Uh, so in that respect, uh, that helped a lot. Uh, but I want to add one more thing. We are actually closing a deal, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks. Uh, it will be our eighth investment uh, here in France, where the factory visit uh, happened with a Zoom call, just like the one we're having now. We had the head of production that uh, received the script, exactly what we wanted to see. So it was almost like a, you know, a director of a movie. And we said, okay, this is the script. And he was running around with the GoPro and you know, filming everything and with a mobile phone and, and all that. So uh, you know, we, we managed to, to complete that part. And uh, it was, uh, I think everybody had a bit of a fun time to do it because it's not the classic thing you do. Um, so I think uh, for, the, for, for companies that have like 95% of the data ready, so you can do your due diligence from remote, it's fine, you can do calls, you can do Zoom calls. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, yes, I, I don't think uh, this period is, um, uh, is the death of fundraising. As I said, we had three fantastic uh, up rounds. We had uh, one company that is about to close and probably one more before the summer. Yeah, we had a similar, similar experiences in the last uh, month. Uh, Zoom calls with uh, investors for factories and, and production, production elements and and actually, we managed to have a couple of uh, companies in our portfolio to fundraise in, in this period. And to other companies, we, we advise them to make a cash pool and try to get as much, as much cash as, as possible in order to, to, have a, 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 to pass the year and start the, the year with a fresh uh, cash pool. We have um, another question. Uh, and, uh, um, in food, Amazon decided that they need an omnichannel strategy with physical stores. Uh, do you think that physical presence is uh, mandatory for that to consumer? Uh, it allows you to go at a different speed because, for example, the Cortilia case before I told you, it was very easy to plug in three new servers because you buy them, you plug in and uh, everything uh, goes uh, smooth. But uh, the making a new warehouse in these times is absolutely difficult. So if you have a physical presence, you can create another business model. You create like uh, the delivery, the quick delivery business model. And this allows also to open the click and collect part. Because actually in the, um, uh, when you look at the customer sentiment survey, what they are afraid of is the contact in the supermarkets and the queues. And if you have the click and collect, you can avoid these two things, but still you have less constraints than delivering, uh, than delivering the boxes at the house of the client. Mm. So this allows you to go a little bit uh, further, but you have also to be structured, of course, to to have this kind of, uh, of business. What I think is that a few uh, retail chains will transform uh, some shops into dark stores. Actually, what you need is a physical presence, not in terms of uh, stores, but in terms of uh, logistic apps, let's say. Uh, so it's uh, physical presence, yes, but uh, not absolutely stores because what you need is maybe a few square meters <laughs> of uh, dark store in every um, highly populated quarter so that you can make uh, abs. And I don't know to, uh, how much you are informed on the costs 
structure of uh, delivery to your home, but actually the last mile is uh, the most expensive part. So if you have a physical presence and you have an agile uh, supply chain for the last mile, of course, it allows you to scale up in a different mode. Okay. Uh, I wanted to add just maybe a point from, from the other point of view. So um, I think the question is, you know, can you build a big business just that to consumer? Um, I, again, nobody really has the full answer, but this is, this is our opinion. I, I think there is no reason uh, that you cannot get to 40, 50 million in revenues with B2C if you execute really well. After that point, probably um, you will have to concede the, point, the fact that you know, still the majority, the vast majority of the food is bought in physical presence. So avoiding retailers and, and other you know, food services, if you wanna get to you know, 200 million, 300 million revenues, eventually you have to cross that point. But, the difference is that if you come to, um, uh, to Carrefour, if you go to Cortilia or Corte Inglés, and you have 20 million of revenues direct to consumer, you know the name, the name of the dog, the name of the children of your customer, you know when they shop, which day, what, what, what type of discount they respond to. Um, you get into the conversation with a buyer uh, in a retailer with a completely different balance of power you know about your business and about your customers infinitely more than they do. And your brand, when you're making more than 10 million in revenues in one country, is a brand that is there. And that conversation, that dynamic is completely different than the one where you're going there hoping not to be squeezed on margins and on you know, marketing activity and other things that you have to do because that's what retailers are really, really good at at getting their margin stack right, and you have to pay for it. So rather than you know, dropping your price on your core product, you say, ha ha, no, 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 we've learned the trick. Our core product stays online. We'll develop one for you with a different packaging, a different thing, so you keep things separated. The whole dynamic is different. But I think to get beyond 100 million in revenues, omnichannel is much better, and I think it's a more successful strategy also for product companies. Good. Perfect. So we don't have any, any more questions. Um, I want to, to thank you both for, for taking your time and, and being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, hope to, to meet you soon, Ivan, again. Um, and I uh, hope to, we can meet uh, soon as well. Thank you. Thank you, too. And good night. Thanks. Thank and you. Hasta for, la próxima. For the rest of the audience, we are continuing with this uh, series of seminars. We will be uh, announcing them like uh, a week before through LinkedIn, as, as we did with this one. Um, we are going to keep on uh, running uh, this type of uh, activities related to how uh, startups and corporations can continue adapting to this uh, new reality. Thanks, everyone, and hope to meet you soon.